Hello, and welcome to the Mindful Movement Podcast. I'm your host, Les Raymond. Thanks for tuning in today for another episode. I got to reconnect with a good friend of mine, Randall James from Always Adaptive. We talked about uh, many things around wellness, mindset, mindfulness, meditation, fitness, recovery, nutrition a little bit. And it's great. Randall and I used to work together in Maryland, and now he's on his own helping people learn how to um, play a bigger role in their sense of well-being from the comfort of their own home. I hope you enjoy the episode, and I appreciate you tuning in. Randall James, thanks for joining me on the Mindful Movement Podcast, man. Thanks for having me, Les. I appreciate it. For the listeners out there, Randall and I go back a little ways. I, as I've mentioned, run a gym in Maryland, and Randall was um, just a fantastic coach, a colleague of mine for several years until pandemic hit, and you headed south to the Carolinas for a better life, um, better weather, night yeah. friendlier people. Yeah, and it's been uh, it's been really great to see what that move has done for you. And I'm looking forward to hearing more about it. And you also, um, you are offering training still remotely. And I'd like to learn more about how that is unfolding for you and what that process looks like. And I know you have a wealth of knowledge about fitness and health. And um, it'd be, I'm just looking forward to have a conversation with you about that stuff and hopefully uh, listeners could um, grab little gems along the way. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to it, man. So I remember when I first met you, you were working it. So the gym I I run is in an office building and you were working for a company in the office building and they were doing like a group tour for like a company membership. And uh, there's a lineup of people in front of me. You're the only one that looked remotely like uh, athletic or whatever. And you raise your hand on the like tour. And it's like, can you teach the barbell lifts? And I was like, heck yes, man. And then <laughs> it's like everything changed. You came down and we worked together for a while. And then you under you underwent such a beautiful transformation over years to um, getting really in tune with your body and the mechanics and kind of getting a, a, obsessed with how the body works and fitness and then became a um, just a really first rate coach for others. And I got to witness it all. And I was grateful to be, I was upset that you left town, but I was really grateful to be able to witness and be a part of your journey. And I uh, just wanted to share that with you. Well, thank you, man. I, uh, Moving down south was a big decision because um, my, my whole family is up north. So, you know, I'm, I'm missing my sister. I'm missing my mom and dad. I'm missing all the friends that I grew up with. I'm missing you. You know, you were a huge influence in my life. And I've told you that several times. You, you were more, I mean, at a certain point, you were coaching me. Um, and it evolved into sort of like a mentorship. And you started coaching me on so much more than just fitness on mindset on you know meditation philosophy stuff like that and so all that stuff bled in so it it did hurt to to come down here but ultimately it was such a great decision i I mean i'm in such a better headspace down here Um, i would encourage anyone if they can get somewhere closer to nature it's a beautiful thing um I just, I feel Maryland didn't have that for me. And every time I, I came down to North Carolina to visit Spencer, you, you remember Spencer, you, for the audience, this is one of my childhood best friends and I would come down and visit him. And there's just a lot of lovely nature down in North Carolina. And uh, every time I came down here, I just, I fell in love. So I was like, you know what? I need, I need to live here. This is just, this is a special place. Yeah, I'm glad that you found that. I mean, I'm kind of blessed here because I have a little nature in my backyard. But in Maryland, um, at least in like central Maryland, there is a lot of there is nature, but you you generally have to drive to it. Um, You know, you have to go out of your way a little bit. It does exist. But just because, you know, it's like tucked away. It's like orderly. um, And it's not quite as abundant and flourishing as it is down south. So I'm glad that you've, you've landed there and, um, and you're happy with it. So you, you know, you, your company, your 
um, channel, which by the way, I was looking through your, I'm never on Instagram, but to prepare for this, I saw you recently and you said, you know, you're posting to Instagram. So I kind of binged on your stuff and it's fantastic, man. You're doing a great job conveying messages. Very clear. I applaud you for it. And um, I don't know where you learn such good technique on some of those exercises, <clears throat> but you're really, <laughs> really doing a good job. Um, but it's called always adaptive. Yes. And, you know, that definitely resonates with me, that name. We both have gone through quite a like transfer, you know, transformation, you know, physically, mentally, through our like our health journey. Um, can you walk the audience a little bit through yours, like how you initially got into health? What was it like before that? Maybe, um, you know, maybe a glimpse into the childhood, maybe the whether there's family relationships that are related that you want to discuss. And if you're not comfortable with that, that's fine, too. But um, take take us uh, take us for a little ride on how you got to where you are. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. So uh, childhood was uh, a little rough. There's some relationship stuff there that I'm going to stray away from. Um, stuff that I'm still processing and trying to deal with. But uh, yeah, I mean, talk about trying to find every escape that exists and whether that's through substances or um, running away, you know, just, just escaping. And so I ended up throughout my childhood and my teenage years on experimenting with several drugs, um, had no idea what food was. So, you know, eating all the sugar in the world, all the processed food in the world, uh, became overweight, uh, dealt with se severe depression, was on medication for that, uh, had some bouts of self-harm within that. Um, and then along the way, I ended up getting diagnosed with ulcerative colitis, uh, which for those of you that don't know what that is, it's essentially inflammatory bowel disease, uh, end up with issues with your colon, issues on the toilet, essentially. And um, had some really weird other inflammatory issues. Uh, at one point they thought I had lupus, but then they're like, no, it's not that. It looks like rheumatoid arthritis. And then they told me I had fibromyalgia and like my lips were swelling up. My fingers were the size of sausages. Like I had to take a lot of time off work at one point because for me to even get out of bed and put my feet on the floor to walk was like just searing hot pain. So like I couldn't walk, I was, I, was, I was bedridden for a while. And, you know, meanwhile, just getting bigger and bigger and, you know, ballooned up to, I think at my heaviest, I was, I wanna say I was about 275. Um, right now I'm about 179, close to 180. Um, wow. And so- Wait, how old are you when you hit 275 and you had all these medical issues? So 275, so it was, it was ballooning throughout my teens. When I was my heaviest, I was probably when I was in my early 20s. So probably 21, 22. Um, and, and I'm going to be 36 here in September. So it was a long, long time ago. But uh, yeah, along the way, dealing with all these issues, no one even uttered a word to me about fitness, about food, about hydration, about anything. So I'm, I was just flying blind, taking whatever medications the doctor was giving me, going in for these three hour long infusions, these Remicade infusions, uh, tons of side effects. And, you know, the most advice I ever got was stay away from onions or, or, or stop eating spicy food, you know, like that, that was, that was the, the length of it. Um, and then luckily I had a friend, David Strand, I think you met him a few times at the gym and he drug me out to the gym. So, you know, honestly, David, if you ever listen to this, you saved my life, man. In a lot of ways, he, he, drug, he drug me out to the gym one day and we had a great time and, and I fell in love instantly and I never looked back. And as I started making these changes, I started to realize that my symptoms were going away. And I'm like, well, what is this? Not only was I losing weight, but, you know, a lot of the inflammatory issues I was dealing with were gone. And, and I mean, gone. Uh, and, you know, for the longest time, I was med free. And there's been bouts where I get back on meds to deal with various issues. But um, 
largely my quality of life has improved to such a dramatic degree. It's, it's pretty insane. So yeah, uh, ended up working at that tech company, uh, came down to the basement and I actually was trying to organize a wellness program because, you know, it's funny, you go to these corporations and these businesses and they have like donut Friday or, you know, just, they, they, they try to treat their employees. And in my eyes, I'm, I'm like, can we treat with something a little better and I know it's lame but like can we get some fruit in here or something but then I realized there's a gym down in the basement I'm like maybe we can get a wellness program going and that's when we came down and you know you and I met and that was great but uh and they did I don't remember were you the trigger that because they got like a company membership for all the mem all the people in the company that wanted a gym membership yeah yeah that was me they put me in charge of like trying to get people to you know, like going around the office and like, hey, did you go to the gym this week? You know, and you were the annoying guy. You were the yeah, I was the that guy. Watchdog. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't pushy though. I, I think uh, I was pretty laid back about it. That's great. So you get into the gym. You, so what were the initial changes? I, you know, I didn't realize. I don't remember you telling me. I'm sure you did back in the day that you were on medication for depression. At what stage were you able to let that go? Um, that's tough. That was a really long time ago. So I was diagnosed, diagnosed with depression, I think when I was 14 or 15 and I tried several different medications. Um, actually, I think I was able to get off meds pretty, uh, a pretty significant time before that fitness journey started. Okay. Um, so I wouldn't directly attribute that to maybe fitness. Maybe I had changed some food around or maybe started sleeping better. Who knows? But, uh, the it was mainly the inflammatory issues that that's when I started seeing the changes when I was going through my fitness journey all the inflammatory issues started to die down but you know we know depression is an inflammatory issue so hmm. yeah and that's when you started changing your diet too and eating cleaner paying more attention yeah yeah, yeah it's interesting like you went through such transformation I remember it's funny because now I saw you recently, you were in town running a race. Um, and it's funny, I, I used to run distance and I swore off it several years ago and you never did. Mm -hmm. Now you're into it. And I feel like our body types has changed quite a bit. I remember a time <laughs> where you were pretty thick. You know, you've always been muscular since, you know, I've known you, but you were a big guy and I was like 155 pounds for a minute there. Yeah. And I saw yeah. you recently and I feel like I'm significantly larger than you <laughs> and you're all svelte. Um, yeah, no, that's a good point because I remember my heaviest muscular wise, I was like 195 when I was working out at CoreWorks and I'm like, you know, nowhere near that. I mean, as a matter of fact, probably five, six months ago, I was, 167 and that's like the lightest I ever got but I started to recognize that I didn't feel good at that low of a body weight you know it's like when you when people talk about health they're like oh well you can be too healthy and and skinny and I'm like I definitely felt that 100 percent. I, I did not right. feel as good so you went on this uh massive like physical transformation but also mentally I mean both of us we we kind of in parallel to some degree I remember early on when you were pretty young, still working at the gym, we would battle a bit and you were, um, we were both kind of a little close-minded at the time and pretty sure that we were right about the thing mm -hmm. we were talking about. Yeah. And, you know, we would battle a little bit, like verbally battle about some of the concepts in the gym. And, um, and then like over time, you know, we both kind of went through mindset changes there. And now like uh, the conversations we had over the last you know few years, even though they're not as regularly, we both learned how to be way more open-minded and way better listeners and way more objective about like, or, you know, new ideas or, um, and that's been kind of neat to experience with you. I mean, I remember thinking you were kind of like an angry kid. Um, absolutely when we met and you had a lot inside you and you could see I know you didn't want to touch on childhood stuff but you could see there was a lot of like pain and suffering in there that had built up and um, you know 
and it definitely affected how you related to me and other people in the gym. And then as um, you kind of work through stuff individually, you know, it just changed the way you interacted with everybody else. It, it's like, as we learn how to, um, I don't want to say believe in ourselves, but really ultimately like love ourselves more, like our relationships with others, whether it's other people or environment is always limited by our relationship with ourself. And I got to watch the, re the relationship with yourself change. And then in turn had this like, um, like slingshot effect towards everyone else around you. And I got to watch all the members of the gym and the fitness clients get to reap the benefits of you, like, growing into this, um, you know, better version of yourself. And it really showed in your ability to be open minded ability to like, listen with more intention. And then eventually, the tides turn a little bit, I think I learned a lot from you, and I would go to you for questions. And what do you think about this? And we would, you know, I would try to solve puzzles with clients that had complicated issues and um and we were able to like communicate so much better about things that previously would have been like a bicker fest you know yeah. and it's there's so many ways to adapt and this you know this uh this phrase you chose always adaptive it's like it makes me think of how we used to talk in the gym that you never like turn it off like there's no switch like i'm going to the gym at one o'clock, let me flip on my adaptation switch. It's like, oh, it's always happening. Like if you're sitting in a chair now, listening to this, you're, you're adapting to the chair. If, yeah. Um, you're always adapting to your environment, all the inputs and information that are being imposed on the body and, and the mind and the way we think. And, but, and the inspiring thing too, is working in the gym. We've both worked with pretty old people. Yeah. And even though the rate of adaptation changes like it does the active adaptation can go a long time like i remember having someone in their mid 80s um who couldn't like get down on the floor and get back up came in with a crane uh, with a cane like within six months was you know basically able to physically take care of themselves and you know you don't think of people in the mid 80s like getting getting stronger like people don't think like you could still get a lot stronger than you are like the adaptation component of being uh, a human organism or an animal of any kind it it doesn't have a time frame it doesn't have yeah. parameters it's just always ongoing and fluid yeah for sure and there's there's a lot there the the thing that stuck out the most to me is uh you know as we age, yes, that adaptation takes a little bit longer, but like, for example, I was just this morning working with someone that's in their late sixties. And this is someone that has lost complete and utter control of his spine. He does not know how to move it. And so the first session was built around, let me teach you what your spine can do. Let's see if you can get your spine to do those things. And he was, it was a struggle, it was very little movement. But this next session, instantly, he is able to move way more than he was. Like he has way better control of his spine. And now we can kind of evolve into the hip hinge and the squat and all the stuff because he can maintain posture where he could not before. He, he didn't know what posture was. Um, and this is a guy that he owns a construction business. He was an athlete, still is an athlete. Like one of his goals is to play soccer and hockey, you know, in his 70s. And I'm like, fantastic let's go for it you know um and that's like that's really where my passion lies is with like that is my favorite population to work with because i want them to understand like there's there's been times where i'm out running and someone will pay me a compliment and i'm like you can do it too man he's like maybe when i'm maybe when i was in my 30s he's like if i if i was your age i could do it and i'm like you still can man it's it's not too late you just need to work on it. It's never too late. It, it's just a little harder to build muscle. Yes, but strength is a skill. And if you practice that skill, you know, multiple times a week, a bunch during the month, and then all of a sudden a year has gone by and you just put in the, the hours, you'd be surprised what your body can do. Um, on the mindset thing, really, that came a lot from, I remember one of the things we struggled with early on was, was meditation, mindfulness. And 
I, in my early years, I wasn't such a big proponent of it. And now if I could snap my fingers and get the whole world to do one thing, it would be meditate. It would be practice mindfulness because it has been such a game changer in my life. Because if you really think about what it is, I mean, mindfulness is just paying attention. You're just becoming aware of everything. And if you think about it, that applies to your weightlifting form. That applies to your emotions during a stressful conversation. That applies to your ability to relax when you're sleeping. That applies to your ability to remember that you haven't drank any water today. You know, like the list is infinite on how many applications there are for that. And um, so like you used to ask me, did you meditate? Did you meditate? And I'd be like, no, no, no. And like deep down inside, I'm like, I'm never going to (laughs) meditate. But one day I did. And, you know, I didn't see any benefits at first. And most of the people that I've gotten to meditate, they don't see the benefit at first either. And it's not really something that you see the benefits of until a year has gone by. And you're like, I just had a really good year. You know, it's like one of those realizations that kind of pops up out of nowhere, or like you have like a really good week where you're just kind of floating in flow mode, you know, work is great. Your workouts are going great. Everything like you're just paying attention to all these different things. These different aspects of life just seem to be coming together in a way that they weren't, you know, um, and emotion is probably the biggest aspect of it, you know, not being more in control, not in a way where you're ignoring emotion, but you're, you're, you're able to allow that emotion and then move on and be okay with the emotion and move on and be okay with the emotion and just keep going. Um, so yeah, it's been great, man. And, and again, I have you to thank for, for a lot of that. I appreciate the compliments that you've paid me, but you know, you were a game changer as a mentor for me. Oh, thanks for the kind words, man. Yeah, making space for for the emotions, um, acknowledging them, moving on. I remember, I don't know where I heard this. Um, one of the probably prominent like meditation teachers, but explained it almost like your mind, imagine your mind is like a bucket and you could fill it with like rocks and each rock represents like some piece of like suffering like the shit of life like this rock is uh this guy was late to an appointment this rock is this to-do list this you know whatever they are and um and you like could fill the bucket with rocks and it feels like there's no space like the buckets filled with densely packed rocks And then as you meditate, the bucket gets bigger. Like imagine taking the bucket of the same amount of rocks and spreading it out of the floor in your living room. And now your living room is the mind. And it's like, okay, you have all the same shit in there, but there's like, there's space, you have space for it. It's not necessarily running the show. It's like, you could see everything. You could acknowledge it. You could more skillfully navigate all the choices and decisions that um, is needed in life in the context of all those rocks sitting there um yeah and you're right like it happens smooth i'm sure for some people it's like uh you know one they have a first time you know amazing experience and it's a pivot point and everything changes but you're right it's like it's subtle and those little changes add up um you know a little bit every day just like with all the other things like the exercise you know if you go to the gym and you start or you're in your living room and you start doing push-ups if you try to get fit or get strong or big this week doing push-ups after i don't know sitting on your ass for a decade or two uh you know that's not gonna go well but you'd be amazed at how little you need to do if you do it three or four times a week to have a dramatic impact over time like it's yeah. it's less than what most people think. In fact, as I get older, I'm realizing this more and more. I feel like I need more time to recover. So I'm working out less often. And there was, it wouldn't have been long ago where I've, well, I would have had an insecurity about that, like a fear of like losing gains. And I'm yeah. noticing like, oh, this is actually, I think, working better. Like maybe I was aiming, my aim was off on what that minimum effective dose was and the real benefits are in that recovery 
process and I'm lifting weights less frequently now than I have in many years and I'm not losing strength. It doesn't, it doesn't take that much. You could, you could practice something once or twice a week and I think make gains for a long time. Yeah. Um, you, you bring up a really good point there. And in fact, uh, like on the, on the topic of the rocks and the bucket, you know, like when I first started working out at CoreWorks, the gym that we worked at, I was really big into bodybuilding. And so I'm like this big buff dude jacked out of my mind and I felt like crap. And I started taking a look, I, you know, I'm doing these two hour, two and a half hour workouts, six days a week, seven days a week. And to the bucket analogy, you know, I, I actually use that, but in a different way, I, I say it's a pitcher. Um, and what we don't understand is that we have this pitcher and all of our stresses go into that exercise is a stress. And so if you have work stress going into that picture, relationship stress going into that picture, and then you start to add exercise into that picture, that can make your picture overflow too. So if you're not addressing the things, you know, there's parasympathetic and sympathetic, rest and digest, parasympathetic, fight or, fight or flight, sympathetic. If you're always fight or flight sympathetic, which exercise, work, stress, relationship stress, all that stuff, and you're never doing parasympathetic activities other than sleeping, which let's be real, most people don't sleep well anyway. Um, that picture is going to overflow and you're going to end up with, with issues. So yeah, it's, uh, it's been great decreasing the amount of weights. Now, I've also introduced running into my life, and that's been an incredible journey too. I mean, I'm in love. I don't think I'll ever stop, regardless of your opinions on <laughs> endurance running. I, I do give you shit over the endurance running. <laughs> Dude, I mean, it's, it's been pretty incredible for my, for my headspace. And I also try, I, you know, I have a very addictive personality, so I'm trying to not fall into that trap of running away from something, you know, and, you know, like there's people that they run marathons several times a year, or they start to dip their toes into ultra marathons. And I think, a lot of those people are running away from something and there's a lot you, of stuff. That's, why do you say that? Like, cause you get the endorphins, you get the yeah. adrenaline and the stress hormones that feel good at the time when you're running. Why, why would you make the assumption? It's just not farther down the same spectrum. Like if you yeah. don't think you're running away from something, why would somebody that runs farther necessarily be running away? Yeah, that's a good question. So, you know, I, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I'm any different. And this is actually a projection. So I do find myself like I started that off by saying, I try to be careful about not letting myself fall <laughs> right. into that trap. So, and I notice it, you know, so it's like, you know, this week I run this amount of miles and the next week I start to run more miles and then more miles and more miles. And then I'm like, hold on a second. Like what's going on here? Why, why are you doing this? And it's enjoyable. Yes. You get all those chemicals, those feel good chemicals, but, um, it's, it seems to me the amount of time, I mean, again, it goes back to the scale of parasympathetic and sympathetic. If you're spending, you know, two hours a day running on top of that weightlifting, if, if, if someone does do that, say they weight train two to three days a week, um, and then you add your job into that, you know, you add any, any number of different things. Lepping the There's kids no, to soccer practice or. Right, whatever. exactly. There's no time for anything else. So I just, I see it as, you know, whenever I try to talk to someone about meditation or just spending more time on that parasympathetic scale or the end of that scale, it's always, I don't have time. And I'm like, well, you're spending three hours running however many miles, you know what I mean? Like, where can we shave off a little bit here and, and add a little bit more to this? Yeah, effort? it's it's hard for runners to to cut into their running time. There's a there is a commitment. Like if as a runner, I know if you get an injury and you can't run at all, like it's not long before depression setting in. You know, it might be yeah. temporary depression, but it's gonna it's you're really gonna feel it. Uh, you know, we're addicted to whatever we're familiar with. So you know whether it's running. 30 miles a week or whatever or you know if you eat the same thing for lunch every day and then you take it away it's going to be a problem mentally emotionally like there's anything we do creates a a momentary expression of chemicals in the mind 
So like once we get used to that, that mix of chemicals are, we're going to expect it and want it. How do you yeah. hold up like structurally? Uh, because um, I mean, you're still pretty young, but 36, um, you know, picking up distance running kind of, kind of late, you know, you're not 18 or whatever. How's the body held up to, to like the beating and, you know, the repetitive impact of running? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's definitely given me a whole new perspective on recovery because in a lot of ways, if you think about, if you think about it, running is a leg day in its own right. You know, especially it's <laughs> come on now. I just mean in terms of the accrued damage that right. you're gaining from yeah, it. So sure. like if you do a leg day, that's accrued damage. And then you do a eight mile run the next day, that's accrued damage. And then you do another leg day. So like for me, for example, right for when I was at the peak of my running, I was doing an upper body, lower body split. So that's two leg days that were fairly intense. And on top of that, I was doing three running days, an interval day, a tempo threshold day, and a long run on the weekends. And I started to realize like, this is five leg days. And I didn't understand that the damage that I was getting from that leg day, it's not as if that damage doesn't apply to the run. Like, and I started to notice that my runs were suffering. And then yeah, having aches and pains, uh, knee pains, calf pains, just, just weird things. And so I had to take a step back and I dialed my running back and to now I'm only running twice a week. And I think um, that's opened my eyes a lot to the minimum effective dose. People, if the stimulus is right, you don't need to do that much running. So for example, the long run, what is the purpose of the long run? Well, it's to increase your aerobic base to allow you to go for a really long time. So you go really slow for a really long time. That's the stimulus. You don't want to run too fast because then you have to stop. It defeats the purpose. And then you have an interval run. That's your speed work. If you're doing a 1200 meter interval, you're going to have to take breaks. So you do 1200 meters and then maybe you take 90 seconds off and you do that eight times. You don't want to run too slow because the stimulus isn't there. You have to run at a specific pace. And so if you're addressing the two, the two sides of the coin, that's really all you need. You don't need to do five different runs a week. Right. Like some people talk about recovery runs. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. And I, uh, or junk you know, miles, think, you hear that junk miles. Yes. And, and that's exactly how I feel about it. If you are really advanced, um, like if you're running a marathon at like a six minute pace, okay, then maybe there's a, there's a pace at which you can recover while running. Most people, they're not recovering while they're running. If they're running, that's more damage. That's work, you yeah. know. So you cut yeah. from three runs a week to two, yeah, which is actually a big. I mean, percentage wise, the third you're cutting a third off, thirty three percent off your your run. So that's a, a big change. Let's talk about more of um, what you do now, as far as helping others and like logistically, and, and what's the process look like? Because you're specializing now in helping people remotely from the comfort of their own home through like the the zoom interface and you know i see you have in the background uh you know for the listeners randall's got a pretty small room behind him with some basic equipment and you know i i know that you've always been creative and i'm sure uh that you've i would assume that you feel that people don't necessarily need to have even as much as what you have but not at all if you have enough room to kind of get down on the ground um you can do a lot is so ba is that's basically the training you're doing now the one on one through a zoom interface and you work with people what once or twice a week uh yeah i mean it's at their own discretion but it's either zoom or if they have an apple like if they have an ipad then i like to do facetime um but really it's it's minimal equipment i'm a really big fan of kettlebells i think it's one of the most versatile tools that you can use and uh there's an adjustable kettlebell that i you know one of the questions that I ask when I'm kind of first introducing myself to a client, go through an hour long, like free session, kind of a discovery call, getting to know the person and uh, set intentions and all that good stuff. And I'll ask them if they're opposed to purchasing equipment. And most times it's no. So they get a tripod. So my iPad is on a tripod right now. Um, and then they get an adjustable kettlebell and that's it. It's just, do you have a space to work out in? Yes, you have a living room. Okay, let's move that table and set your tripod up. I can see you, you can see me clearly. 
and we just work through the process of teaching them what their body can do uh, and progressing them through all the kettlebell movements from deadlifting to kettlebell swing to overhead press, push up, rows. You know, if they want to, if they're more of like an athlete, we start to get into power development and that looks more like, you know, snatches and stuff. I mean, there's really no limit and you can build a pretty good physique just with, you know, like some people will have two of those adjustable kettlebells and that opens up a lot in the front rack position, you know? Um, so yeah, I found that, and this is just me experimenting on myself before, you know, when the COVID lockdowns hit, I realized that these lockdowns can happen again. So if, if we don't find a system that's sustainable where people can just work out from their living rooms, then every time there's a lockdown, thousands, millions of people are going to lose access to their health because they close down gyms. Um, so yeah, that's really what inspired me to start this is to be able to teach people how to work out from the comfort of their own home with limited equipment. Um, and so that they can do that anywhere. I mean, if I want to go, there's a lake down the road for me. If I want to take a kettlebell with me and go do a workout at the lake in the sunshine, I can do that. If I'm traveling to my parents' house, guess what I'm doing? I'm putting a kettlebell in my car and I'm not going to miss a workout because I'm traveling. So it's just, uh, it's been invaluable, uh, the kettlebell training. You know, I, I think more people should embrace it. Barbell training is great. I love that too. And if I was at a gym, I'd be doing that as well. But um, yeah, there's I just, something I, to be said for the the versatility of, of a kettlebell. And I mean, you're using adjustable ones. I will often just have somebody just pick one and you, it's amazing. Like you can go maybe six months before you need a second one. Yeah. Um, so when we were working together in the gym, we focused a lot on, and we were both kind of deeply entrenched in learning this stuff at the time. If you were to look at like uh, fitness from a spectrum of different qualities, we worked a lot on like competency, which, you know, for the listeners, basically like how well you move, how well you control yourself in space, given the you know natural parameters of like the ground, gravity, and three planes. Um, a lot of that, a good amount of strength, and then like a little bit of power, a little bit of uh, conditioning, like cardiac capacity. Have you changed at all? Um, not with what you're personally doing for yourself, because I know you're into the the running um, addiction now. But the um, <laughs> but have you changed at all? Like how you approach, let's say, the average. 40, 50, 60 year old that just wants to feel better in their body and, uh, you know, get off the couch, wants to move, doesn't necessarily have the confidence of what to do and is seeking guidance. And then they find you like, are you, do you have this, a, a similar, a same approach that you did when you were working in the gym with me? Yeah, uh, largely, but I've also, I've started realizing the importance of hypertrophy work. I mean, I've always realized it for myself, but I mean, as you know, the first thing that goes your fast twitch muscle fibers as we age. So yes, training speed and strength is very important, but also if people are lacking muscle mass to begin with, that's a pretty big deal. You know, and, they and for, won't the, even... for the listeners, I'm sorry, I don't want to cut you off there, but just no in case you're not familiar, hypertrophy essentially refers to the, the growing of muscle, um, getting, yeah. building new muscle tissue. Um, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no problem. I uh, appreciate that clarification. So if someone is lacking muscle to begin with, they're lacking contractile potential. You know, they, they don't have the potential to contract their certain muscles. So that's kind of first thing I look at. If I see someone, I'm like, okay, well, what is your background? Were you an athlete? Were you in the military? You know, like a lot of people from the military, they just have a pretty solid baseline foundation of muscle on their frame. So we don't have to spend too much time on a hypertrophy unless they want to. And that's a big deal. If someone wants to do something, I'm not opposed to that. Ultimately, their goal is my goal. But when I start to dive into the elderly population, speed work is extremely important to me. So, you know, if I can get them to put a little bit of muscle on their frame and then over time progress them to uh, more explosive movements like the cutaball swing, like the snatch, jumping, single leg jumping, you know, just teaching them how to land, teaching them, you know, how do you apply force into the ground quickly? 
because when they look at people that fall, they fall because they literally can't move their feet fast enough to catch themselves. And so in my eyes, speed is like probably the most important thing. And if you don't train fast, you're going to lose your type, type, uh, your fast twitch muscle fibers. So, you know, your slow twitch muscle fibers, you can walk all day. And that's a fantastic, you know, I think most people, more people should be walking, but that's not going to build up your fast twitch at all. You have to put some weights in your hand. You have to move fast. That's interesting because, you know, when you think about training for um, longevity or quality of life, however you want to um, phrase it, you, you do see old, strong people. They are out there, but you don't see a lot of old, fast people. Yeah. You know, there, there is something to be there. And, you know, I'm guilty of not training that as, as much as maybe I, I should or whatever. Maybe I don't find it as enjoyable. It's not like my default go-to, but there's something to be said for that because I think, I think I have read about that, what you alluded to that, that we lose that quicker. Um, yeah. As you get older, you lose that quickness. And yeah. So when you're, so when somebody falls, it's like you slipped and you have this moment of opportunity to move one foot really quickly yeah. to, to, to broaden that base of support. And if you yeah. don't like that, as everybody knows, that could be kind of the beginning of the end. That's where, you know, you get the hip fracture or whatever, where the yeah. best thing for that is to, to not fall, to catch yourself. And then I guess if you do fall is to have a little muscle, to have some cushion yeah. um, muscles, nice, uh, protective dense tissue so maybe uh you know the hip bruises but doesn't chip yeah and and also it makes you more durable not in just a passive way like being a cushioning but if you have strong muscle fibers around your spine if you fall on the ground on your side and your spine is jolted in a really like quick fashion someone that doesn't have good connective tissue strong muscle strong connective tissue their spine could twist and contort in a really awful way. But if they have those muscles there that are reflexively working the way that they should work, it's no big deal. Yeah, they twist and contort, but their spine, their muscles kind of grab on and they're like, we're good, you know? So I, I think it's, it's beyond, but I, I have seen, you know, they start to say that as you age, being a little bit heavier is actually a good thing. It's protective, okay. you know? Yeah, and I suspect it's because of that cushioning aspect. There might be other uh, things too. I've, I've been thinking about this. Granted, I'm probably thinking about this over the last year to make myself feel better about the weight I've gained. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I know that I've been really light and I've probably been too light. And I, I know, I mean, I used to be really heavy. Um, so I know I've been too much. But learning more and more about metabolism and how our body allocates resources and that there's always like a choice, you know, of, you know, what to allocate the resources, you know, metabolism kind of governs everything, everything requires energy. And there's only so much energy to go around. Sometimes I wonder, is it better when I say better, like, protective from a health standpoint, to be 10 or 15 pounds, I wouldn't say overweight, but have 10 or 15 pounds extra unneeded weight relative to like one ounce, not enough. Because the moment yeah. you're technically underweight, your body has to give up something. And it's probably going to prioritize the energy allocation towards what keeps you alive today. But ultimately, things that keep that you want to be robust for the long term staying alive have to be back burnered to, to some degree, whether it's your antioxidant system, your immune system, things that are maybe metabolically expensive and aren't the necessary hormones. today. Yeah. Hormones. Um, it, it does make me wonder. And it's funny because I've heard people from other countries talk about how if you see somebody really lean, like, you know, Instagram lean or whatever, um, that that's like, like the town will be concerned, like the family, the, the tribe is concerned about that person. Yeah. And they try, you know, and then people start bringing them food over as gifts. Like they, you know, it's a problem for the, it's a weak link in the tribe when somebody's, too, when somebody's skinny. Yeah, um, that's, that's a great point. And that's something I've tried to talk about quite a bit because 
you know, it's tough because I am lean. I do have a pretty good physique. So I try to convey that I'm not as lean as you think I am. I have good genetics on the front, but I carry a lot of my, my fat in the back. So like I have love handles and I'm okay with those love handles, but my body fat percentage varies from, you know, right now I'm probably closer to 12%. Whereas like, if I ask someone, one of my friends that knows me, like, what, how lean do you think I am? They're like, oh, you're 8% body fat. And it's like, just because I have a six pack and I'm not, hmm. if I let myself get down that low, I feel like crap. So absolutely. There is, I think there's a sweet spot for everyone where you can be too big. You can be too small. You can have too much fat. You can be too lean, you know, because it's not as though the fat that's on your body isn't being utilized. That fat is constantly being turned over and utilized like the same way your dietary fat is. If you eat some fat, that fat's like, if you're a male, some of that fat's going to be utilized to produce testosterone. It's not as though your body only uses dietary fat. It's going to use some of the fat off of your body too, because you're not eating 24 hours a day. It's a constant cycle that's continually going, even when you're sleeping, when you're sleeping, you're not eating. So how's your body producing testosterone? It's using some of your body fat. So yeah, I think uh, having spare body fat and not being that 8% body fat, you know, it's, I think that can be very dangerous for a lot of people. And matter of fact, I mean, if you talk to any sort of competitive bodybuilder, they're going to tell you they feel like crap most times, uh, especially like the closer to competition it gets, they're not feeling too good. You know, they're dehydrated. They can't hold on to any water. Their, their meals are extremely lean. It's just plain white meat, chicken and, you know, broccoli with brown rice. And, and that's it. Maybe like a dab of ketchup for flavor, you know, it's terrible. So yeah, it's that's something. Living. Yeah, it's not, man. And there's more to life than, you know, I, I also try to, if someone comes to me with an aesthetic goal, okay, let's, let's go for that. But I want you to understand when you reach this goal, what's going to happen? Is your finished journey going to end? No, you're going to want to keep going, but there's going to be something that happens when you reach this goal. It might be fulfilling when you first hit it, but you're going to realize you probably don't feel too good. So to me, it's important for people to understand, like, let's think about longevity. Let's think about your future self. And I have a saying, whenever I do anything, it's hashtag for my future self. And that's important because I know that that future Randall is going to thank me for the decisions I'm making today. And that's something that escapes people. And that's part of mindfulness, being able to project into the future and pay attention to the stuff that you're doing now, you know, to make sure that it's in line with the person you want to be five, 10, 15, 20 years from now. Um, that's a pretty big deal to me. Yeah, for sure. You know, it's, it's something that we don't think about. I know I've mentioned to clients over the years, um, you know, in like the business world, which I'm not in, fortunately, but I guess a lot of my clients are over the years. So I'll, I'll reference this so that it, they could draw a connection to it. Like I know businesses are always like forecasting, you know, it's like, um, oh, we did 10 million in sales this year and that, you know, or last year. Now our plan is to do 11 million or whatever. So they like work backwards, say, well, we, you know, we need this much sales per month. We need this much sales per day, which means we need to spend this much on marketing this week. It means this is the task today. It means this hour of this day, I'm doing this. It's like everything is pointed in a direction of an outcome that's been identified. Like they, there's a light already has been shined on this goal. And nowhere along the way, like in the education system or, you know, unless you get lucky with your folks or influenced by the right person, do we get this lesson in regards to our health? You know, when you're in high school, they're not like, think about what you want your health to look like when you're 60, 70, 80, 90, and then identify the qualities that would need to be cultivated to deliver that. Yeah. And then break that down to the, um, you know, the routines that you want to, and the practices you want to have regularly in your life, and then break that down into what's the activity you do right now. Okay, you dedicated an hour, 
Um, it's Tuesday, 7 p.m. This is your time to do whatever for your physical body. Like, what's the thing you do to now so that the activity and, and all the intention you're putting into it is aimed in the direction that you I identified? It's like without the forecasting of like, well, where is the where are we going anyway? Um, it's hard to make those decisions clearly and you could wind up kind of going down any path like i want to do this for this reason or this for this other reason and they're not necessarily aligned with something that you actually care about because you didn't take the time and think about what do i care about and what do i what do i want it to look like so that future like i'm doing this for my future self uh is a is a great concept and it's really useful to think about not just what that future self would like look like and be able to do like, let's say you want your future self to be able to play with your grandkids, you know, get down on the floor, play games with them, or even great grandkids, whatever. But even connected with like emotions and feelings, like, what would it feel like to do that? I remember I've had clients that had like uh, real mental blocks around stuff. And we would work on like mantras where they would imagine they, they kind of are where they want to be and ask themselves like for adjectives that come to mind of like how it feels. So it might be something like, oh, I feel strong or energetic um, or, you know, full of vitality or whatever. And then create like a little mantra where it's like, I am strong. I am energetic. And something to like to just to connect with, not to like dwell on all the time, but to yeah. to connect to, or to to reconnect to the values and the direction in which you know, the choices you're making right now are, are aimed at. And I think that's really important with exercise, with the physical, the physical exercise is such a, it's not that it's like this inviting portal, but it's like, in some ways, it's the lowest hanging fruit to improve the relationship with yourself. Like, it's a great place to get started. Because, um, you know, the tasks are clearly identified. There's a big, there's like, there's a finite nature. It's a beginning and end. Like you have to do a set of this. You use this weight. You start here. You go from some, you know rep one to rep eight. Mm -hmm. um, they're not as abstract and out there as like maybe improving the way you think about things or how you handle relationships in tough times. It's like it's a piece that's easier for people to to bite off if you will, it's a, it's a great, like on ramp to self development and self growth. Yeah. I mean, I, I fully agree with that because getting in touch with your body, in my opinion, is, is a bit easier than getting in touch with your emotions. And most times, at least in my experience, I find that if someone is kind of falling off the rails with their life, um, with their health, there's usually some sort of emotional thing connected to it. There's a reason why they're you know, eating the foods that they're eating or partaking in the behaviors that they're partaking in. Um, and so just getting them, I mean, again, it, all signs point back to mindfulness because exercise is a form of mindfulness. I mean, if you're going to have proper form on a deadlift, for example, like your spine has to be in a pretty specific position, you know, your shoulders have to be in a pretty specific position for you to uh, be able to lift a sizable weight or a Turkish getup. You know, there's a lot going on in a Turkish getup. If you're not very mindful of all the different parts, how are your feet touching the ground? How are how is your hand touching the ground? You know, that in and of itself is awareness. That is mindfulness. And the more people get in touch with that, the more I find they start to understand how they can get in touch with how they're feeling on a given day. Um, and, you know, back to the projecting into the future thing, it's like that is it's such an important thing for people to identify where they want to go that direction, because then they can start to break it down into bite sized pieces. You know, most times people jump into a fitness journey, they they bite off more than they can chew. They try to do too much at once. And something I've tried to get people on board with is being okay with doing less just like we were talking about earlier in the conversation but your your workouts are getting shorter as you as you age you're starting to understand that you don't need that much to be healthy to feel good and in fact doing too much oftentimes leads to catastrophe so you know getting someone to like okay you have this huge comprehensive program it's like the best program ever it's perfect it's covering all the bases 
But if you're not going to do the program, then it doesn't matter. So what will you do? How much will you do? You know, um, and if that's just doing three sets of one exercise to begin with, fantastic. You know, like running is another big one. People, they're like, I want to run a 5K. It's like, have you ran a mile? No, start there or start at half a mile, you know, get used to that. Because I feel like when people start to get into running, they say, oh, I hate running. And it's like, well, tell me about your experience the last time you ran. And they'll say, I ran a 5K and it was awful. 5Ks are awful. You know, like if you run a 5K, <laughs> you're at full trip for 3.1 miles. And that's, it's awful, you know? So not understanding the pacing mechanisms there, you know, not understanding that you can go longer if you slow down, not understanding you have to work your way up, you know, do 0.5 mile, work your way up to a mile, do 1.5, two miles. Progression is very important. Um, so yeah, no, it's, uh, it's tough because this is kind of, again, why I try to stray away from the aesthetic goals, because again, if someone wants to do it, we can do that but understand it's not going to happen overnight. And the people that you see, you know, the Instagram models that you deem to be the perfect physiques, they've been doing it for 10, 15, 20 years, or maybe they were a D1, you know, football player. And so like, you're like, wow, they have a lot of muscle on them. But if you don't dive into their background, you don't understand that this person was a serious college athlete probably a serious like obviously a serious high school at like literally they've been doing it for Thousands 20 years of reps. Yeah. right right and, and so, they still might feel like shit inside <laughs> you, don't, yes. you don't know if they're happy or healthy yes yeah. yes aesthetics do not lead to happiness and you know i learned that the hard way now my aesthetics are a bonus point but i don't focus on it you know, I, I really don't care about the way that I look anymore. I, I am worried about my performance, not just in my workouts, but in my relationships and, you know, just my ability to sleep, my ability to do anything. Exercise and health ultimately impacts all aspects of life. And um, yeah, it's just been, it's been a godsend, man. Can we, can we talk about sleep for just a minute before I let you go? Yeah, for um, sure. Do you have any go to because I, I know and again, especially as I get older, it's just so important, like the difference of how I feel after a good night's sleep compared to a compromised night. It's um, it's hard to express in words, you know, that, that how vast that gap is. Um, do you have any hacks lately or practices um, that you feel have been supportive for you and your clients around getting better sleep? Yeah, so. Um, I mean, right off the get go, I would recommend anyone that is serious about improving their sleep, go follow Andrew Huberman, because he by far has the most in depth him and Dr. Matthew Walker have by far the most in depth podcasts on sleep on nutrition for sleep on, you know, actionable free and cheap things that you can do to improve your sleep quality. So I would direct them to that because I'm not an expert at sleep. But just for my per from my personal experience, um, <laughs> I hate to beat a dead horse, but mindfulness, um, you know, one of the things that happens during sleep is we wake up in the middle of the night and then we end up on this train of why can't I fall asleep? Why can't I fall back asleep? And then the frustration starts to set in. Um, and being able to catch myself is invaluable. And when I catch myself, I tell myself, it's okay that you are awake because you're still resting. So like, even though I'm not sleeping per se, I'm still, if I can scan my body and relax my body, you know, Andrew Huberman talks about non-sleep deep rest, that's still rest. So while you may not be recovering your mind in the way that deep sleep would, would do that, you're recovering your body. And what I found is that that's been really powerful in taking away a lot of the pressure of like, you need to fall back asleep right now, because the more I think of that, it's like, it's not going to happen at least for a couple hours. So yeah, I mean, I find now if I wake up at two or three, I mean, I'm up for five to 10 minutes and then I'm right back to sleep, you know? So that's been a huge one. Lights, lights is another huge one. Um, I'm really big on uh, the second I open my eyes, I make my apartment as bright as I can. And I actually have blue light bulbs 
in all of my lights to simulate sun. And then whenever it's nighttime, I, it says dark, it's pitch black in here. So like the hour leading up to me jumping in bed, it's pitch black, there's nothing. Um, that's been huge for me, um, for sure. Just limiting screen times, getting the phone away from me. I mean, these are all things that I'm sure you practice and most people probably do. If they don't, they absolutely should. Uh, light is, you know, setting a timer on your hormone production. So like your cortisol should spike at a specific time during the day. And if you're waking up at different times every, throughout the week, you know, one week you wake up or one Monday, you wake up at six, Tuesday, you wake up at eight, you know, and, and it just, it's chaotic like that. Then your body doesn't know when to produce that, that pulse of cortisol that slowly, you know, kind of tapers down throughout the day. Um, so setting that on a timer, waking up at the exact same time every single day, even on Saturdays and Sundays, I mean, that in and of itself is extremely valuable because it sets the timer on cortisol, but it also sets the timer on melatonin, and GABA, which melatonin will get you to sleep. GABA will keep you to sleep. But again, if you're on a chaotic wake schedule, you're going to be on a chaotic sleep schedule. It's not going to know like that circadian rhythm that happens is on a very specific timer. And so as soon as I get out of bed, these lights are on and it's as bright as humanly possible. And if it's bright outside, I'll go outside and get that. But a lot of times it's still dark, but um, yeah, light, light exposure has been huge. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. So uh, tell folks how to reach out right now. You do are still offering um, private sessions and I encourage folks for those that want a little guidance. Um, it can go a long way um, to kind of help you work through any kind of transformation, any kind of change that you're looking for in your life. What's the best way for folks to reach out to you if they want to see if working with you is a good fit? Yeah, so a few ways. Uh, they can email me directly at randall at alwaysadaptive.com. They can also go to my website, alwaysadaptive.com. Um, and I have several packages on there for private sessions. Um, and then I'm also on Instagram at alwaysadaptive. And yeah, it's uh, I'm, I'm very proud of this product that I've created. I think it's very comprehensive. I think... Um, allowing people to learn what they're capable of from the comforts of their own home is an invaluable tool. And it is an all encompassing thing. It's not just about, like I said, the aesthetics, you know, if that's what you want to do, we can work on that too. But I would really encourage people to take a more holistic approach to their health and start to think about their future self and what would their future self think about how you're living your life right now hmm. that's well said um let's wrap it up with that randall thanks for taking the time it's always good to see you it was great to see you in person recently um let's do this again sometime maybe next time you're in town we'll do it in person in the studio and um i, I just really appreciate it and then of course for the listeners out there thanks for tuning in i hope you got some value out of it and um if you think you want to take that step i definitely encourage you to reach out to randall he's a very supportive coach and if you think you also know someone in your life that could maybe use that that guidance that help please um send the message their way thanks again everybody hope you have a great day thanks Les. thanks again everybody for tuning in i hope you enjoyed the conversation i sure did it's always great to connect with randall i miss having him around the gym we used to get in uh the great heated discussions and debates and um it was good for both of us i think and i'm glad that he's out there helping others now he definitely has a gift and i do believe he should be giving that away so if you're out there and you do want some guidance and you want to create a pivot point in your life um check him out see if it's a good fit i highly encourage it i've personally witnessed firsthand uh, Randall have just a tremendous impact on people as they go through their wellness journey. So uh, keep that in mind. Thanks again for tuning in, everybody. And uh, I hope you have a great day.